Hello world, welcome back to another Pico CTF 2022 write up video. In this video, we're going to be walking through the GDB test drive challenge. This is a reverse engineering challenge and it is worth 100 points. Let's get into it. Can you get the flag? Download this binary. Here's the test drive instructions. Okay, so they kind of give us the instructions we need to run in order to, I guess, solve the challenge. But they're not telling you like what these actually do, right? So I want to actually do a little bit of a deeper delve into this binary before we actually run these so you can, can kind of get a better feel and understanding of why we're doing that. And I'll show you exactly how we're going to do that. So here I already have the challenge loaded and no, I did not need to change the perms on GDB me uh, executable. I think it just automatically gave it those permissions when I copied it into Cali, but you may have to do that. So what I'm going to do is actually run a tool called cutter on it first. And what cutter does is it's just a graphical version of Radari, which is another reverse engineering tool. But the cool thing about it is one of, it's one of those that gives you some pseudo code that you can look at. It's executable code technically, but it's basically taking the assembly code and converting it into something more readable. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run that. And okay. And let's maximize this and take a look at what we're looking at here. So. On the right, you'll see the decompiler and on the left, on the left, you'll see the disassembly. So here's all our assembly code. And if we click on main, right, because that's usually the function we're concerned with, you'll see all the stuff it was able to translate to. And this is way more readable than this. So if we come down here, we'll see a rotate encrypt. And I wonder if that's actually decrypting our flag for us. It probably is, because if we look here, right, we can actually see some of the plain text here that it's being posed as. These are readable hexadecimal values, right? These are not just unreadable hex characters. These are something. And it looks like this rotate encrypt is, in essence, going to decode it and give us the flag. So when we debug this, we probably want to see what kind of output is being put on the stack, right? What kind of data is being pushed to the stack via this function so that we can see what the flag is. But obviously right now, this flag is obfuscated based on the, you know, the variables that are being set here. It's not the actual flag. And that's all I really wanted to show you. But this also helps us out because we can see where we need to jump to, right? We want to jump to this rotate encrypt function, probably, because that's probably going to have our flag on the stack. Now, when we run jump, and I'll get to this in a second, we want to make sure we actually break point somewhere where these values are loaded onto the stack. Say I started the program and I broke at main. That's what a breakpoint does. It You re execute the code and it stops at a certain point in the code where the breakpoint is at and won't continue executing until you tell it to. If we just break at main and then jump immediately to rotate encrypt, right? Or this address right here, we're not going to get the flag we want because we skipped over this part where these hex values are being set, which I'm guarantee are going to be basically the encrypted variables that are going to be rotated here in rotate encrypt, right? In fact, we again, we can go look here and we can even see that our IVAR2, which I think was outside. Yeah, here's our arguments for it. If we go back to main, we can see that the arguments for it were var underscore 30. And if you look here, var underscore 30 is one of our values here. So yes, rotate encrypt does appear to be the function that is essentially rotating the encryption or in other words, decrypting what's on the stack. I hope I didn't talk too fast there. And I hope that made sense. We are going to run into an issue though, because we have the sleep function here. So we need to make sure we break somewhere around here, right? We want to make, well, Essentially, we want to break right before the sleep function to make sure we got everything onto the stack, right? And oh, actually, no, we should be fine breaking at the sleep function, actually, because it's not until we step over or into the sleep function that it actually executes. So we're fine with breaking here. It'll break right at the sleep function, but technically you could say it breaks right before the sleep function because, again, it won't execute unless we actually go past it. So, and then if we break here, then we can jump here and we still have all these values loaded, but we bypass the sleep function because I think the sleep function is going to hang us as we'll see here in a second. So I'll keep that over to the side here and I'll bring this over here and we'll make a new or not. We'll make a new tab. There we go. 
Let's go ahead and maximize that for y'all. All right. So if we just run G GDB me, is it GDB me? Yeah. You'll notice it just hangs, right? And that's because we're running into that sleep function. Like it's getting to that sleep function and it's just hanging because it's telling it to sleep. So we got to stop that. Now we are going to use GDB, of course. E me. And you'll see this says PETA. And all PETA does is it gives us some extra formatting and output and shows us some more information than we would normally see with GDB. Like it saves the trouble of typically having to print out specific variables and stuff that are on the stack using GDB because it, it'll print that out for us and in different colors. Let's go ahead and clear so we can see it a bit better. So if we, let's go ahead and say start and that'll take us to a temporary breakpoint in main and we can say disassemble main and we'll notice that we have the main function here in assembly and it's going to match mostly what we see over here. Okay, so if we scroll down, we see our rotate encrypt and we see our sleep here. So that matches our sleep and rotate encrypt over here. Pretty neat, huh? Now, one thing I want to show you real quick is let's go ahead and quit out of it and let's run it again. If we disassemble main now, you'll notice that our addresses are different and that's because the addresses change once the program is compiled in memory, okay? So we could use these, right? Like, I think if we go back to the challenge, it literally says, yes, it's going break main plus 99. And then all that's saying is, so break at main going up 99 addresses, essentially. So the breakpoint would actually be here. And that's fine, because it'll reference that when it runs as main plus 99 and get the actual address here. But if you tried to do asterisk and then this address, right? If you tried to do break and then this, that won't work because it's trying to reference an address in memory that doesn't exist once it's running. And I can actually show that to you right now. So if I do run, see, cannot access memory at address, whatever. Now, that being said, let's go ahead and you know what, we'll just reset it. Again, nothing, no, it's pretty easy to reset it. And then what we wanna do is we actually want to say, okay, let's go ahead and set a breakpoint at main since we know that that works. And we'll say run, all right? So now we can see all this extra stuff that GDB normally wouldn't give you. And you can look through it. And normally if you're lucky enough, it'll give you the flag that's on the stack because it can easily convert hex to ASCII, one of the beauties of PETA. But let's go ahead and disassemble main and you'll notice the addresses have changed. And remember I said we want to break right at the sleep function so that way we can get all these hex values onto the stack, which is going to be our encrypted flag, right? Because our rotate encrypt function is going to be decoding these down here. So let's go ahead and break point here, right? And you'll notice this actually matches what's in the challenge, right? They tell you to break main plus 99. Notice this is main plus 99, but we can just copy this. We don't have to type in main plus 99. We can just say B asterisk and then the address. All right, now we can say continue. Okay, so now we've reached the address we were just at and you'll notice that those there's those hexadecimal or plain text values added to the stack. Now they're a little bit longer and what's happening here is that each variable is being concatenated essentially to the bar underscore 30 that we saw over here, right? So this one right here. So if you notice this, it, it's just going through each stage of cat concatenation. So this is getting attached to this, this is getting attached to this, and then this is getting attached to var 30. It's backwards because remember it's last in first out or a stack. Now we're broken there. We can easily, right? And if we just disassemble main again, because we can always go back and look, we want to jump over the sleep function because if we step over it or into it, we're just going to, I mean, we're on it right now, right? We're at this address. You can you can tell we're at this address because this equals arrow sign here, right? So this arrow is telling us where we are in the execution of the program. 
This sleep function, again, if we step into it or over it from this point, it's going to execute and we're gonna get hung and have to start over or wait for the timer to exceed, which is like 100 seconds or something like that. And But I'm not waiting that long. So we need to jump over to this address because jumping will prevent this function from executing because we're literally jumping over to it. Not stepping over to it, jumping over to it. So all we have to do that is say jump to the address we want. And again, you'll notice this is plus 104. And if we look back at the challenge, they're doing main plus 104. So that's the same address. Now the benefit of doing this like they did it is that you don't have to run it and then get the addresses. You can just simply type it in like they have it. But this is more intuitive because it's literally going in depth with how this works. So we'll say jumping to that, make sure that's right, yep. And there we go. As soon as we jumped to that address, we got the flag because we did it like we were supposed to. So I hope that gave you a little bit more in depth of how this actually works and how you can actually kind of get a better idea of what's going on. So I know that looking at assembly can be very overwhelming at first, but if you can kind of map it to pseudocode or just code in general, that's more readable, you can get a much better idea of how it works. So if the reversing software you have has a decompiler associated with it, that's a good thing because it's gonna make your life so much easier. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like and subscribe to the channel to show your support. Turn on post notifications to get regular injections of cyber content directly into your feed. Check out our Patreon, join our Discord, and follow us on Twitter. Links in the description box down below. And leave any feedback or questions in the comment section down below. This is Almond Milk. Thanks for watching. Goodbye, world.